Uh, I'm here under slightly false pretenses. Uh, this talk was supposed to be given by a good friend of mine, David Jenkins, who's the director of Coid Cymru. Uh, those of you who know him, Dave's not very well. In fact, he's not very well at all. So he asked me to do it for him. Um, unfortunately, I haven't got a Welsh gene in my body, or at least none that my mother's ever admitted to. Um, so you'll have to just imagine the rolling vowels of a man from the valleys giving this talk. Anyway, trees, soils and water, good news and bad. The forestry industry in Britain was largely driven by the demand for uh, coniferous wood for pit props for mining, uh, led to um, the establishment of Forestry Commission in 1919 after the great losses that were suffered um, in the First World War where uh, enemy boats sank a lot of our boats coming back from North America um, and Europe. So the Forestry Commission was established, say, 1919. We've got here pit props. You can see the ladies, the timber gills working uh, in the forest. Uh, this was in the Second World War. And the drive for conifer woodlands continued until um, the uh, privatization of the Forestry Commission in 1947, I think. And that one's a lovely picture. Elf and safety. The guy's obviously already lost his right arm, and if he carries on peering with his eyes shut, he's looking like he might lose his left. The hat on back to front is clearly some kind of lucky charm to protect him. Damage to um, wetlands was part of the problem um, of upland forestry. You can see here um, early tractor, um, track, track machine, and a plough that's ploughing up uh, upland bog ready to plant trees, had a devastating impact on both water quantity and water quality uh, downstream and on those sites. That's the kind of thing that resulted, you know, typical from uh, an upland forestry or upland um, area where you get huge amounts of water mobilised very quickly uh, following a flash, uh, a period of flashy rain washing down a road, heading down, goodness knows where, but probably into someone's front room. And the other thing about forestry, coniferous forestry in the uplands, is that when the clear felling takes place, you get drying out of soils very rapidly, exposure of roots, um, rotting down of uh, coniferous uh, uh, leaves, pine needles, and you get acidification of the streams. That's fairly typical release of aluminium salts, which are devastating to fish uh, and invertebrates downstream. And so these are the kind of impacts from upland forestry that we are all pretty um, familiar with in Britain. And harvesting on this scale and planting on this scale with, with huge monocultures and then the clear felling that we do at regular intervals is a fairly British thing. It's not something that's practiced quite so extensively on the continent. Um, and the argument goes that it's that kind of forestry which has given woodlands such a bad name um, with many fishermen, water quality biologists, hydrologists. So woodlands in upland areas are very often synonymous with bad things. And that's almost entirely due to our linkage to clear fell, replant, single species conifer forests. Okay, so moving on to a bit of good news. You can reverse those changes, and there's a lot of movement uh, to do that. Uh, simple blocking of uh, drainage channels in conifer woodlands using uh, old conifer brush here. Just blocking it up, pushing it back into those drains. The product of the clear fell, pardon me, being shoved into the drainage ditches. And you can see the result. The water table's begun to rise. Very simple and already you're beginning to get um, something back that approximates to a, a decent hydrology for that piece of land. So that puts a context really on um, our relationship with conifer trees in the uplands and in um, some of the more northern areas of, of, the, of the country, Scotland, Ireland, Wales. Um, the rest of the talk is specifically about a project in Pont Bren, Mid Wales. It's an area of 10 farms, about 1,000 hectares, 
around 300 metres high in uh, the bulk of the land. Um, Pont Brem is a cooperative of farmers who work together to try and establish a better way of managing their farms. They moved from crossbred sheep, uh, buying in straw uh, for winter bedding, in la in inside lambing, to a system of uh, outdoor lambing, uh, more, more uh, traditional native breeds, um, and they used wood chip as the uh, bedding material for the, for the sheep. One of the things they found that was limiting their ability to change was lack of cover, particularly broadleaf cover. If you've got conifer shelter belts, they're very dense. <laughs> the wind throw you get from them, the protection you get from them, is roughly one times the height of the trees. It's very dense, the sheep pack in against them, you get problems of erosion, you get health problems from foot rot, overuse of those areas, parasite problems. With a broadleaf um, uh, shelter belt, the, the area extends much further out on the downwind side because of the porosity of, of the broadleaf trees. So the sheep spread out, you get less issues with, uh, with disease, less problems, and they're able to lamb outside quite effectively. So the first things the uh, farmers at Pont Bren did would go for the obvious and quick wins. They had severe problems with erosion on some of the streams, there were biosecurity issues, um, there were issues of erosion, you can see on the left hand side how that stream's very shallow, eroding out. Um, so they fenced and planted, as you can see in the, in the, sorry, the, left, the right hand shot as you're looking at it, they planted uh, a mix of broadleaf trees. Three years later, you can see the development. Shot on the left, there's a, there's a stream running through there, and on the right, the same stream you saw before, you can see the trees beginning to grow. So they'd made the basis of their, of their shelter belts that they felt was so important to change their farming style. They also planted other broadleaf shelter belts in situations away from the, uh, the streams. Look on the left, you've got the, uh, you've got the hedge on the sunny side, very dense, dense broadleaf planting, more dense than you get in a commercial woodland. And then nice uh, open top, gives you that sort of uh, porous um, wind, wind belt that's so important, all fenced out to keep the stock away. They had a lot of wet areas, um, some ponds, some wetland uh, patches, and rather than try and uh, farm those, they made a decision to fence those out, and in some cases actually excavated pools there, um, and that gave them an opportunity to use those ponds as a water supply elsewhere. That one supplies field, uh, about 12 fields, via um, gravity-fed pipes to troughs. There's also a fair, um, uh, a fair increase in biodiversity there, and they gain a small amount of additional revenue from shooting. Um, they get a little bit of duck flighting on it, which brings in a small amount of, uh, of, of, of money to the farm. They had a big, big issue with overland flow, and this is the crux of the, of the story. You can see there, You've got typical sheep pasture. This, I've been asked to point out this isn't Pont Bren, it's somewhere else. It was never quite this bad at Pont Bren. But you've got sheep flow of water in places gathering into preferential flow pathways. And as you come down the slide towards the bottom, you can see it running out onto a track. Now, that's due entirely to um, a very well-cropped piece of grass, very, hev very heavily um, trodden by sheep, um, clay soil, all the problems that lots of people have talked about already. And that caused them not only problems from far for farming, but it caused problems downstream with flooding. This is a slide that represents the moment when things began to fall in place. I stuck it up the Eureka moment. That's not Dave's bit. I couldn't think of anything else to put on it. Um, this is his bathtub. He went for a walk one day and he saw that overland flow running into those woodland strips and apparently disappearing. Now, he talked to the farmers and they'd seen that as well. And he just was curious. And what happened was he, as director of Coid Cymru, and the farmers in Pont Bren as a group, um, established a pretty intensive research project led by Imperial College which looked at why that water disappeared into that bit of woodland. 
And that's all it is. That was what started this, a simple walk, someone keeping their eyes open and thinking what's going on. OK, it comes to science. Uh, we have to do some of that, I'm afraid. Uh, I hope you can see those clearly. Um, you've got two graphs there. The blue on the left-hand side shows um, the age of planted broadleaf sh broad shelterbouts. Uh, don't worry about the uh, units for the infiltration rate. All you need to see is that there was an immediate benefit, even after two years, for infiltration rate in those broadleaf shelterbouts. And as those trees got older, that benefit increased dramatically. Um, and on the right-hand slide, the red slide, there's a fence line marked which delineates the grass, the grass field from the uh, broadleaf plantation. <clears throat> and you can see that the benefit for more infiltration increases in that broadleaf plantation the further away from that fence you get. And you can also see the opposite impact on the grassland that there's more benefit from infiltration the closer you get to the fence. And what appears to be happening there, and it's yet to be completely proven, but they're 90% certain, is that the roots from those trees in the broadleaf um, plantation are creeping out into the grass field, and that's what's giving that slightly aberrant result. So you're getting the benefit of the trees even into the grass field. Okay. They then wanted to see what mechanism was affecting um, infiltration rates. So this is a very simple experiment. The Danish guy apparently did it. You've got a cross section through a piece of the, uh, the broadleaf plantation, clay soils, and you, they just introduce simple food dye in water, watering can on the top, let it go through, and you can see how that water is going down through those root systems the tree root systems, the blue dye. Um, what that showed was that the, the, the fact that the water was infiltrating within those um, tree, tree belts was not just a, 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 a pure chance. It wasn't anything about the way the soil was being protected. It's actually tracking down the tree roots. So it's, it's almost, the tree roots are almost punching their way through and making a series of straws into the soil through which water can infiltrate and that just shows you um, the different root structure of some of the the trees ash isn't on there ash is a very good one but if you look on the right hand side you've got rowan and beech which are early colonizing trees they're not quite so good but they're still okay and as you come leftwards you're getting more of the um, deeper rooted species um, there's more work to do on that about which species to plant what benefits. There's a whole, you know, a whole raft of PhD thesis to do on that yet. But the principle is sound. It just shows you that tree roots are the mechanism by which water infiltrates into those planted areas. Okay, a little bit more science. I hope this makes sense. On the top axis, top x-axis, you've got rainfall. It's upside down, but the peaks show where the heavy rainfall is, or the troughs, effectively, the, the spiky bits. That's when it rained. On the bottom, you've got um, the green line shows total runoff. The red line shows the overland flow. And the black line shows you the flow through the drainage system. And what that graph shows is that both overland flow and the total um, runoff, which you'd expect, respond very quickly to rainfall events. But the drains actually don't have a huge impact. So what is happening is that overland flow is effectively beating the drainage. So before the water can get to the drains, it has run off. And those drains are not redundant, but they're certainly not working particularly effectively to get water away from those areas. You can all read that. Uh, you can read that yourself, but the important point there is that the is a third one. The infiltration of overland flow in fence tree planted areas is up to 60 fold greater than in sheep grazed grassland. Now remember that 60 fold is actually 67 fold. That's not 67 percent, that's 67 fold greater. And 
one of the sort of classic um, bucket chemistry experiments that Dave did for Prince Charles when he turned up was to get two plastic tubes, whack one into the ground in the grassland area and one into the uh, ground in the sheep grazed area. You can't pour water fast enough into the one in the in the uh, broadleaf pasture in the broadleaf woodland area. It just keeps running out, and if you put it in the pasture one, it just sits there. His comment was, "Why isn't everybody doing this?" Okay, we've got the five-minute hurry up, so I'll scoot on. Flow at Pont Bren. Um, this is a bit of modelling, a combination of modelling and um, actual uh, actual uh, measurements. It shows you that if you take the trees away, your, hydro, your peak flows in the stream on the left-hand side in cubic meters per second increase dramatically. You can see the red peaks. That's if you take the trees away. If you look at the black line, if it's clear, you will see that on the ascending arm of a hydrograph, i.e. when it's raining and the river's picking up the flow, then having um, optimally placed tree belts keeps the flow down in those uh, streams. But what's interesting is on the descending arm of the hydrograph, i.e. when the flow is receding, it actually holds the flow up, which is what we want. In other words, the trees are balancing out the flow in those streams. Uh, okay, again, conclusions from a modelling programme. But like, one but last is the important one. Again, you can look at the others, but the, the, that bottom one. Peak reduction in the order of 40% can be achieved in runoff from these areas from catchments just by planting trees. They have to be planted properly in the right place uh, using the right species, but you can get up to 40% reduction in the peak overland flow from those, uh, from those catchments. Right, where do we go from here? Quickly, um, there's a map. Red, red splodges on there show erosion problems highlighted and they equate to flashy catchment runoffs that's where the farmers chose to plant their woodland. Smack on the button in most cases. They did that intuitively. The modelling shows where it, the problems were. They didn't know it. They found it. They worked it out. Farmers know what to do. The model helps to moderate it and uh, to give them the confidence that they need to do that. And finally, what do we do down here in the soft south? That's a small girl doing what every small girl does as her family home floods. She stood and she had a good time with the water. That water is coming off fields near my house in 2007. That's coming off grass and arable fields from my neighbours. They've got no trees. And that's what happened to my lounge. A year later, my daughter came back to her house, but she had to vacate her bedroom for a year because that's what happened to us and other people. So what do we do about... Um, challenging farmers in these areas, Oxford, the south. How do we move those lessons from the north down here? We're going to do um, a small trial, a little demonstration plot locally with the Cotswold Rivers Trust, um, with Cotswold Seeds and um, with the Evenlow Catchment uh, Group. We're going to do some simple interventions in this field, which include making leaky dams, such as they use in Pickering, um, upstream of Pickering. We're going to do some simple detention ponds. But most importantly, we're going to plant a 40 meter wide belt of trees. And what I want to do is make those trees pay. I want that piece of land to wipe its face. So we're going to look at fruit trees, we're going to look at nuts, we're going to look at firewood and we want to fit that in with the new uh, Countryside Stewardship Programme. We want to make sure that they still get their new basic payment on that land, and we want to make sure that it is monitored in some shape or form, and all that for about 10 grand, which is going to be some achievement if we can do it. Um, but personally, I think you take farming with us. As, as a, as a, I'm a fisheries biologist, I'm not a farmer, I'm not a, water, I'm not a water specialist, but all this water messes my fish up. So, I think we need to work with farming to take them in the right, to take farmers in the right direction with regard to managing runoff. Personally, I think if we can help people and bring them with us, we do so. But I think it's unacceptable with the knowledge we have now for farming, particularly big farming, and I've tried to talk to farmers in this area, big estates, and a lot of them aren't interested, to work with us 
to develop those systems. If they won't do that, I think it's unacceptable for us as a society to continue to pay them extensive and, 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 and um, quite valuable payments, such as, you know, such as their new basic payment, if they continue to manage their land in a way which damages um, our rivers and our housing stock. Thank you.